So uh, today we have the honor of having Professor Gru Bay here. Every year, the International Medicine Institute uh, invites a world-renowned speaker to address medicine from an international focus. No one better than Professor Grube to do that. Dr. Grube, born in Hamburg, he was educated in Bonn, and then he launched a career as a cardiologist <clears throat> from the Bonn Hospital, but very quickly became a citizen of the world, working in and with top academic institutions and medical tech companies throughout the world. In his pioneering career, he was recognized for his outstanding accomplishments in interventional cardiology. He has led in uh, testing drug-eluting stents, new vascular closure devices, new atherectomy techniques, the treatment of the vulnerable plaque, just to name a few. He has authored countless peer-reviewed publications and uh, book chapters. He has received major awards, including the Jeffrey Hartzler Master Clinical Operator Award from the Transcatheter uh, Therapeutics Meeting, our largest uh, interventional meeting in the world, and also uh, the Master of Master Awards from the Transcatheter Therapeutics Asian Pacific Meeting, and of course, the Miami Valves 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award, which uh, we're very proud that we had a chance to, to uh, give him. Uh, Eberhardt is, has been one of the main visionaries and leaders in the development of transcatheter therapies from its very origins in the early thousands. He has investigated and proposed and modified techniques to improve the outcome of transcatheter valvular therapies. He's an open-minded and critical observer, impeccably honest investigator, and a powerful advocate for these modern techniques. Whenever I call Eberhardt, the first question I ask him is, where are you? <laughs> Since I have frequently called him in the middle of the night when he is teaching in Asia or Australia. Everhart has taught most of the world how to perform and improve and master transcatheter treatments. So he has been basically the Johnny Appleseed of uh, transcatheter therapies for valvular heart disease throughout the world. Among his uh, multiple faculty appointments, Everhart is presently the head of the Center of Innovative Medicines in the, in the Heart Center in Bonn, Germany. And uh, he is speaking to us today from Germany, uh, today on the very um, important topic of the effect that the coronavirus will have on medicine and globalization. Eberhardt. Well, thank you very much, Eddie, for these very kind words of introduction. I'm first of all, of course, honored to be able to speak to you. Unfortunately, I cannot see you in person face to face, which usually is so important for us uh, in, if, when we communicate. But this is the best way we can, and maybe we can even address more people uh, by this virtual conference. You know, and before I start with my talk, I wanted to homage this wonderful city of Miami um, with its all of my friends, you can see, some of them here at the very first slide, and you can see on the left side, peace and love, and I think that's more important as we move on, uh, but particularly true for, for, for Miami. And the, on the right side up there, you can see Eddie and his wife. So Eddie, I'm, I'm really grateful that you gave me the chance to have these grand rounds, very honored to do that. And obviously I was thinking when we talked about this a little bit beforehand, you know, I was thinking um, of, of doing uh, the, uh, of doing the, um, which topic shall we actually talk about? And quite honestly, you know, it, it was very difficult. You said, do something with globalization, with the world and, and medicine, and what are we seeing, what are we doing? At that particular time, we thought I could still be in Miami, uh, but unfortunately, that is not the case any longer, and God knows, when this is going to be the case. So I, want, I titled this presentation as Medicine and Globalization in the Age of Corona with a few reflections and a few lessons that I learned from the time of Corona as seen by a structural heart physician. But I think it's not only structural heart physician, I think it is true for all of us. This is my financial disclosure, my conflict of interest, so I would like to start with part one, my diary, February to March 2020. One day in February, I woke up actually in Germany to these news 
with four million with four million uh, Lufthansa sorry with four million Lufthansa miles I could simply not believe that the virus would stop me from going anywhere. Like the most of my colleagues, I was caught by surprise at the fast speed of the virus. And I was amazed by the lack of information about it and the lack of global readiness. I noticed people are running to buy toilet paper as if it was a vaccine. I saw politicians offering snake oils, disinfecting agents and useless anti-malaria pills to therapy. Hospitals were going camping, building tents in their backyards. And I see my colleagues and physicians dressed like aliens just landed from outer space. I'm seeing in all my own family members dressed like space warriors fighting an invisible enemy on the right side to see my son in, uh, in Piedmont, on the left side, his wife, right at the front line. I saw the number of infected growing up exponentially and unfortunately many bodies in bags. Then I fully realized that we have a serious pandemic on hand for which we were actually not prepared. While at home, I watched like many others, the TV news that only added to the public panic. Being in the high risk group, as you know, I just passed the age of 40. I had lots of time in between hospitals work to think about what went actually wrong and what can we learn for a safer future. So let us talk now about globalization. My first lesson, the importance of globalization. And to better understand the role, to better understand the role of globalization in medicine, I have to take you through some basic concepts. How does medicine progress? Here are the main drivers, scientific and clinical research, innovation, entrepreneurship and technology, clinical evidence and business opportunities. If we look at scientific and clinical research, in the ancient world, medicine was developed and progressed in different directions, independent of each other. Chinese traditional medicine started 5,000 years ago. Egyptian medicine started 3,000 years ago. And European medicine started with Leonardo da Vinci in the Middle Ages. So if we look at the innovation, entrepreneurship, and the technology and the impact on medicine, we can say there were two types of innovation technologies that have been instrumental in developing medicine. First, innovations in science. It gave us the tools to understand the source of diseases and to treat them. Second, innovation in technology and communication. This allows us to read and store printed matter, big data and images. And it provides tools to analyze big data and as important, allows us to communicate across continents, to travel and to share knowledge and experience. Marco Polo's five-year journey from Venice to Beijing today takes nine hours, including dinner and a movie. Business opportunities are certainly a driver. With rising costs to attain commercially viable therapies, Financing and business becomes an important partner in the development process. Today, from the idea to the commercialization, developing a new drug may cost up to 500 million and developing a complex implantable device may cost up to 200 million. If we look at clinical evidence then and now, historically, medical experimentation was very limited knowledge and experience remain within city perimeters or within the palaces of rulers and faced heavy resistance from the church and other institutions. In the Middle Ages, during the Renaissance, once books became more available, medical books began to appear as a source of information, but with limited clinical data and limited peer review. Today, 
With high power computers the size of a mobile phone, data is collected and analyzed globally and allows us to conduct statistically significant, globally implemented clinical studies controlled by professionals and regulators. Actually, globalization is not a new concept. From the prehistoric times throughout the Egyptian, Greek, and Roman empires, know-how was transferred from country to country. When the Roman legions occupied the old Middle East, they brought winemaking know-how to those countries so their soldiers could be paid in wine. That was an example of early globalization. We need to accelerate the need for globalization. Fast growth of technologies, more complex technologies requiring specialization, global access to information via the net, availability of efficient communication across countries, increasing global standard of living, accumulation of wealth, and dependence of countries on what happens in other countries, politically, medically, and economically. The technology development acceleration is simply mind-boggling. As you can see here, relatively flat and then steep up with the advent of computers, chips, cellular phones, and now 3D chips. And so is medicine. The fast growth of information. The number of books you need to read to become an MD. In 1670, you needed one book. In 2020, over 98 books. Not only have we substantially increased our knowledge base and solved many unknown diseases to date, but the remaining challenges and unmet needs still to be solved are highly complex and difficult. Solving them requires expensive resources, human and financial, as well as time. Solving them requires multidisciplinary approaches, as said many times. This is a case example, PVT, where globalization accelerated a solution in structural heart disease. The subject, replacing transcutaneous aortic valve. The idea was born in the US. The technology developed in Israel. The key component manufactured in Australia. The animal studies in France. Clinical studies globally in total over 10,000 patients in nine multiple studies at the production now in the United States and Singapore and the current size of business over 5 billion. What does globalization and homogenization mean for medicine? Sharing clinical information across the widest possible base, create a dialogue and peer reviewed criticism, providing early notices on critical and difficult events cases and solutions. If homogenization can ever be achieved in regulations, it will make clinical studies less expensive and expedite availability of new therapies to patients in need. Learning from each other will allow us to combine different reinforcing therapeutic approaches for better outcomes. Is globalization changing the way we deliver healthcare? Making hospitals more efficient by adopting support technologies like IT, allow for specialization, widening the focus and attention of clinical research and industry to emerging countries with affordable solutions, and expand medical education options, creating patient demand for improvement based on information on other countries. Globalization and doctor-patient interaction. Patients are becoming more knowledgeable and educated globally. Globalization allows cross-country and continent consultation. Informed patients will demand more from their physicians. Physicians will learn to work with patients remotely. Robotic technology will partially replace physicians. And patients will be in a position to select their physicians based on quality criteria. So what stands then in the way of globalization? Politics, 
politics, politics. They say globalization is an agenda of the rich states and the multinational corporations. The source of economic crisis, loss of blue collar jobs, increased protectionism and neo-colonialism, conservative politics of isolationists against democratic rights of the ordinary citizens. Historically, globalization was rejected, hmm, even maybe today. However, globalizing medicine proved to be a must. In medicine, globalization becomes a must if we want to achieve the goal of eradicating diseases. People well-being outweighs any politics. Health costs arising globally, globalization can help reduce them. Then my part three, early impact and response to COVID-19. The COVID-19 is global inside the body. Not only this virus impacts the respiratory system, but eventually it is affecting also the cardiovascular and other body systems to a level we do not know for sure yet. We as cardiovascular physicians have to pay attention to such secondary issues. This nasty, highly contagious virus, virus has challenged our total hospital system. Sudden influx of patients, many of them require intensive care, large number of diagnostic tests with limited lab capabilities, staff and patient intensive safety, triage of patients, delay of most elective procedures, lack of equipment, protective items, and ICU beds. All this requires optimal management of resources, improvisations, and shifting of staff to the corona departments, which requires also on the fly additional training. The most critical aspect of hospitals to manage during pandemic, resources allocation. Number one resource, obviously, physicians and the supporting staff. Other critical resources, as we all know, protective items, respirators, and ICU beds. It is critical then to determine how many beds will be or are needed for COVID-19 patients, how much staff is needed to care for COVID-19 patients. In certain cases, a dedicated team for structured heart therapies may actually be needed. Who needs to be tested for COVID-19 and how often? Who and how to protect patients and staff? Maximum protection is suggested with PPE use at a maximum, at a minimum for staff. No one planned for the scope of the pandemic. Resource utilization became critical. The number of infected varies drastically by geography, age and gender. Despite globalization, different regions require different management. For each phase of the infection, surge, plateau, and resolution, different strategies and resources are required. Under pressure, we cannot ignore the need to handle routine, high-risk patients, including those with cardiovascular and structural diseases. If we look at the Canadian Association of Interventional Cardiologists, they try to level the resource restrictions. Hospitals with minimal impact of COVID-19, the level one, can have minor restriction in resource utilization, while hospitals in regions where the impact of COVID-19 is extreme will have vast restriction on resource utilization. Structured heart patients during this pandemic, they still exist. We should recommend the minimalist approach. TAVI should be done with this approach that is conscious sedation transformal access and early discharge. In highly infected regions such as New York City, same, door, same day or next day discharge is required for to have a patients with possible digital and or video follow-up. Staff and patient safety is first. Use the maximum available protection, test patient and staff COVID-19 prior to hospital visits and shifts, Use telemedicine instead of inpatient visits. Keep staff to minimum in an SH procedures. Allocate separate hospital space to COVID-19 positive, probable patients and COVID-19 negative patients. Virtual meetings between staff and then limited patient pre-workup. The triage 
of structured patients were facing this. With COVID-19 patients flooding hospitals, structured heart physicians face the challenge of determining which patient needs to be treated versus which patient treatment can be delayed. Considerations for treatment include obviously uh, how likely is the patient to experience a cardiovascular event or mortality? How ideal is the patient for treatment? Hospital resource availabilities and safety of staff and patients. Guidelines from the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbus University Irving Medical Center suggest categorizing patients into three tiers based on the risk mortality as shown here. On the left side in the scenario A, Consider treating patients in tier one and two and defer patients in tier three. In the scenario B, only treat tier one patients after careful assessment of risk benefit and consider futility. Tier two, done selectively favoring younger patients with ideal anatomy. And tier three should only be done late in the pandemic. The same hospital issued guidelines emphasizing the balance between qualified candidates resource availability symptoms and expected survival. These guidelines also provide specific metrics for aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation to determine patient's risk. As you can see here, tier one, emergent, urgent, tier two, semi-urgent, and tier three, deferred. The Canadians basically provide a similar structure for structural heart treatment. Recommendations are determined by the level of restricted services at hospitals, which are triaged by the prevalence of COVID-19. The American uh, College of Cardiology and SKY guidelines do, did the same thing, recommending dividing TAVI patients into three categories. Consider TAVI with reduced elect, um, ejection fraction, class three, four congestive heart failure, or syncope. Reasonable to consider TAVI include high peak or mean gradient, very small valve area or very low DVI. Reasonable to postpone then patients with asymptomatic severe to critical aortic stenosis. So if we look at restarting structural therapies as many hospitals are doing now, plans should be made for implementing structural um, structured heart therapies after COVID-19 surge. Factors to consider include COVID-19 testing availability, protection availability, risk, patient risk gratification, reconnecting with patient referral base, restarting clinical trials, documentation, resolving patient fear hospitals, and telemedicine and virtual patient follow-up. My last part, other important lessons. The COVID pandemic lesson number two, viruses do not recognize and or respect international borders or trade walls. Awareness and early notice is critical to win such pandemics. Data becomes the key tool in such battle. Sharing resources globally saves lives. We need an early warning global system. All this is also provided by globalizing medicine. Lesson number three, the way we deliver um, HC in the future will change dramatically. More patients will be treated at home. Physicians should be trained also in intensive care procedures. Hospitals should have plans for crisis. And states and countries should have an emergency storage with therapeutic needs for natural or man-made disaster. Digital becomes a key health in lesson number four in to fighting pandemics. Data analysis is critical to let us know what is going on. Patients monitored from home will ease hospital congestions. Informing physicians in real time on developments have the public being informed with real facts sharing medical resources. Lesson number five, trust but verify the politician's role. Trust politicians only based on facts and actual data. Know how to avoid fake news. 
Internet access must be a civil right. We will have to trade some freedom for public safety. Healthcare is an integral part of national defense. Aircraft carriers with sailors infected on board become useless. COVID pandemic lesson six, different lifestyle. What is new and important? Working from home, washing hands, soap really destroys viruses, learning to cook, family and friends, social distancing is annoying but essential, shop the internet, the end maybe of big malls, and appreciating nature more. Lesson number seven, innovations in medicine. We need to keep supporting it. Scientific and clinical research, innovation, entrepreneurship, and new technologies. Even in days of crisis, we should keep data and information based on clinical evidence, not on shortcuts or improvisations. The COVID-19 pandemic lesson number eight. Finally, the soldiers that are standing on the front line protecting us during a pandemic are the physicians and the medical teams. They deserve our respect, gratitude and support day in and day out. Then in conclusion, viruses, bacteria and other diseases do not recognize and respect political borders and trade barriers. It is beyond just business. It is our professional and human obligation as physicians and healthcare entrepreneurs to bring to any and each human being the best possible therapy. Global collaboration is the prerequisite to succeed in reaching the utopic goal of HC to provide solutions to most diseases. We are all one world, one mission of making life better, safer, and healthier to all. With that, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate two very important parts in my, in my life, Yuval Binur, who is a long-standing friend and mentor of mine. I've been discussing this topic with him in Israel and me in Germany. So thank you, Yuval. And of course, all my family and family members that have supported this crazy guy for many, many years. Thank you all and be safe. Thank you, Dr. Gruba, for an excellent lecture, very timely with lots of provocative things to think about. Um, we'll open the floor up to questions. We have some time. Um, maybe I can begin by asking you um, to uh, tell us a little bit more. When we talk about globalization, you sort of got to the point uh, that although it's global, there are clearly many nations in the world that range from the Sudan in Africa to the Amazon jungles in Brazil, that although we talk about globalization, they really don't have the same, um, they're all not at the same starting point, nor do they all take advantage the same way of globalization. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, what, um, what has been your, um, uh, what have been the challenges that you've been able to identify and overcome in uh, structural heart disease to truly uh, bring true globalization to not just the um, industrialized world, but to the part of the world that doesn't have the same, um, the, the, the same uh, opportunities. Thank you very much, Roy. This is <clears throat> obviously an important question. And when we talk about globalization, we all know we haven't achieved total globalization for many, many reasons. Having said that, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying to get better and better over time. And the more we face situations like this, the more necessary it seems that we continue on that path. Now, having said that, obviously all of us, particularly the physician of my generation, um, have experienced a wonderful time uh, by traveling, social networking, 
and lectures. And that has been a huge and important part of this globalization process. We share knowledges, we teach and we proctor technologies that are not necessarily available in countries that are either uh, suffering from financial lack of financial resources or even lack of education. Nevertheless, we go there and we teach them. And this is a huge chance. Just as an example, if we go to countries um, in South America or better even the subcontinent in India, Bangladesh, um, hugely popularized uh, um, countries, they basically, the general population is poor. Nevertheless, that offers huge chances for us, giving technologies, alternative technologies that should be developed, um, at, you know, in order to cover diseases that otherwise could only be covered with expensive um, uh, de um, devices. Just as an example, not everybody can have a percutaneous aortic valve replacement. What you can do is develop alternative strategies to overcome this problem, easier, less expensive, and uh, less sophisticated, if you wish. So many things that I believe will have to overcome, and you ask for the barriers. The barriers are widely cultural, the culture, as in, I always say as an example, in, in Asia, for example, people just don't like to have a stenotomy. People don't like, patients don't like to have their chest cut open because the soul might evade from their body. It's a cultural issue that have to be respected. So in these countries, always less invasive procedures will be preferred lack of financial resources. If we look at drug eluding stents as an example from previous times, or now structural heart disease, um, the TAVA devices, it simply way, way, way too expensive. Here, the market will come in, and as we develop more and local devices in India, for example, or in South America, the prices will go down and even people might be using local devices over devices from big, um, big companies of the, in Europe or United States. So there are many things, basically financial, cultural and educational barriers that have to be overcome in order to really um, move forward in the best way possible. However, the lack of those doesn't mean we should not keep trying it. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dimachena, do you have any, la I see no other questions on our chat. Uh, yeah, I, uh, first of all, uh, very interesting uh, perspective on, on, uh, on globalization and so forth. I, there were a couple of things that I, I was thinking about that I'd like you to comment on further. First of all, uh, in Germany, how are you? How are you seeing? You were a little bit ahead of us in uh, in uh, in getting the virus uh, more widespread, and a little bit ahead of us in seeming to decrease the virus. How are you seeing the hospitals um, uh, responding to the crisis there? And whether you think that uh, that when do you think that you'll be back to almost near normal um, uh, activity? And um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is what do you think the, the impact is going to be, I guess, mainly in the short term, I hope anyways, uh, but for international training and, and student uh, exchange and so forth, which we obviously do a lot at the University of Miami. I think that about 25% of our residents are going to be foreign born. I don't, I don't know if they're coming from foreign countries, but I mean, the United States is, uh, is the classic example of globalism. So, um, so those, I wanted to see a couple of comments on those areas. Yeah, so, um, what, you know, you asked, the, the first question you asked, why is it, you know, that apparently the first wave in Germany um, came across reasonably well, I should say. Um, there, there are reasons for it. Um, which obviously, um, as we moved along, we've learned it. But 
there has been, we have been looking, first of all, we have been, I believe anyway, we have been very well prepared for this virus fairly early on. Um, our researchers, you know, our, I know our virologists from Bonn and the, 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 the one in Berlin, for example, they have approached the, uh, the, uh, the virus DNA, the Chinese uh, um, publicized this and released it fairly early on in January. They immediately started um, building um, research on the basis of those viruses as early as in January. So we took this, or the researchers, and for that matter, the politicians took this very seriously. And I don't think the denial um, was much, much less than in other countries of the world. So that's number one. Number two, when, when I think um, it became the, the testing availabilities, very early on, um, our politicians listened, listened to, the, um, to the experts and the experts looked at the countries that passed or were in the middle of the crisis, which is South Korea, China, uh, and Singapore at that time. And one of their keys was a massive testing uh, in the population, which has been achieved in Germany. We, test, we tested at the time when it began uh, per week, like 30 to 50,000 uh, patients. Now we're doing between six and 8,000 a day. So this is a very important aspect because it can control the tracking and all you know why that is. Number three, the, the social distancing um, was very important and the Germans um, listening, like I think, like any other population, they listen in times of threat, internal or external threat. They listen to leaders. The leaders obviously have to be empathic, they have to be intelligent, they have to be convincing. And we believed in our political leadership. They were, it was balanced, it was, it was well done, it was honest, and we've, we knew that there was a risk if we don't follow those rules. So it has nothing to do with German discipline. Maybe it helped a little bit, but basically, when our chancellor said, we have to face this, which has been unprecedented, we don't know any, we don't know all of the answers, but there's one thing that we know for sure, that you know we have to test, we have to take this seriously, and you have to maintain social distancing. And that we have to done, uh, that, that we have done fairly consequently until today. The, the, the issue of masks is a cultural issue. Easier in Asia, more complicated in, in our Western hemispheres, but basically now we all use masks in, in when we have agglomeration of, of patients. Eddie, if this, is the, if this is the end of it, probably not. We are already, the German government is already preparing for a second wave, but exactly this is important also for the first one. If you try to deny what might be coming, then you're running into a problem that we have been facing in, as an example in New York City, or for that matter in Singapore, where they open up and then they overlook the clusters of foreign workers in these bad um, housing conditions. And the second wave came in, which was much, much more difficult. So basically, um, personally, I believe in, in social distancing, uh, Eddie. I know you are living in the sun state. Uh, it is much more difficult in beautiful weather and and beaches, young people, all of that is understandable. At the end of the day, um, we pay the price and uh, eventually they will pay the price. And uh, we have to see who's right and who's wrong. I'm happy, very honestly, that in these days I'm in Germany, well controlled. As I said, I can go out, keep my uh, distance and, um, and uh, the, the, the restaurants are opening up on, on Wednesday always with, uh, with the distance and, and, and access of, of, of people. So that's, that's a very important point. The other one that, that you're mentioning, how can, we, how can we overcome this period? When, when do we believe, are we coming back to normal? Um, I, I would like to separate that. I think what we're doing now, exactly now, is just a very, very good tool for international communication or global communication. 
I don't know how many uh, people are dialed in, but you reach many, many more people. You, you know, many more people have are less intimidated to ask questions um, as compared to a large audience when you have to stand up in front of 5,000 people. It's much easier to communicate, much more direct to ask questions and answer questions. And, you know, you, you, we have to use those means now, and I'm sure it will be used, whether the time of these huge meetings um, will still be the way it, it used to be. I, I question that. And we have more and more of these virtual meetings with even virtual life cases and virtual discussions. So why not making, um, taking advantage of this situation? Um, the teaching is, is more direct and is equally successful as in, in a teaching in person. Now, having said that, obviously, in, on a patient to, to physician relationship, that becomes a little bit more complicated. I was just listening to a webcast where telemedicine uh, was, was propagated. The problem is a patient that is sick still needs a personal contact to his physician. That is still the best way. This is why we actually um, uh, uh, took a choice and, 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 and you know, our profession is a mutual communi communication face-to-face. -face. That is something that patients need and physicians need that also. But we have to find a balance. You don't need to see every patient after uh, he has been discharged from uh, after a successful treatment. And let's take an example of, of a TAVA patient. We can follow them up via monitor and you know you can, he can call if he has a problem. And if there is a problem, he can come in. The restrictions that we have now are obviously um, very, very different. This is just um, very unique. And when this is gonna come back to normal, I don't know, but we are normalizing. You know, United States is, is opening up again, as we all know. My son in Georgia now, uh, he tells us that, that um, this is geographically different from state to state in the U.S. Florida is different. In Illinois, where my daughter lives, is very, very rigid still. California is different. We as a country are smaller. We have a larger population, but we are opening up. And thank God, all these state leaders here in, the, in, the, in, in, in this country follow the leadership of, of, our, of our chancellor. So this is, a, this is a very good thing. As bad as it is, it also represents a chance of maybe finding new ways of, to communicate. And finally, when there's travel, which really hurts me the most, to be honest, um, I don't know when that's going to be coming back. Um, I, you know, this is so bad. Um, the, the, the travel industry, the tourist industry is just awfully, you know, they, they are, they're basically down, as you all know. When that's going to be resumed, I hope, at some point in July or August. Um, but it's not only about the planes. It's about opening borders. It's about how do we communicate? How do we let patients go on board of airplanes? How do we uh, temperature or COVID testing? Um, how do we, how, how do we uh, maintain global distancing in countries like South America? In South America or in any other country where it's, um, you know, um, um, where you have warm and hot, humid weather, they don't like to live in homes. They're not used to live in homes. They live outside. They live on the beaches, on the streets, in the bars. Very, very difficult. So how that's going to come up, I don't know. I hope that we will, we will not have a problem. I know that in Brazil, they have been, and still denying it, uh, not Brazilians, but uh, at least the president and some of his followers are denying um, the the virus, but you know you know where the numbers are and how the numbers are. Um, if they're not reported, the numbers are obviously down. But even there, they're they're going up. Thank you, Dr. Gruba. We'll have one more question from Dr. Marcus. If you are still on the line and can unmute, you can ask your question. Aaron. So she wrote in the chat. The, um, do you think the U.S. government's disorganized and ineffective response to the pandemic will affect, will affect global perceptions of American medicine? And if so, how? Do you see the U.S. losing its leadership in health matters as a result of this? 
I'm just reading it. I'm not saying I... Um, I, I think it is a fair question. And let me, let me answer it this way. I have been trained in the United States. 50% of my heart is American. All my family lives in the United States. My son, my daughter-in-law, my daughter, my wife, they all live in the United States. So I have no anti-American feelings whatsoever. But that doesn't mean that I don't see things critically as we all do. Uh, and, you know, I, I think um, what surprised me, what surprised me, and it was not only me, it was on a webcast with one of the, our icons in, 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 in intervention cardiology, Dr. Um, Dr. Leon, and I can cite him. He said, we thought our medical system and American medicine is leading in the world. Be an example of how to treat patients, research most advanced. Well, I think we have to put this, you know, putting this into perspective now of what's happening. Um, we have to kind of question that role. That doesn't mean that America, with its incredible sources and power, um, both financially and as, as, as people, as the power of the population, they will resurrect and they will, uh, they will do well. Political leadership, as you well know, and that's why I was very careful focusing more on Germany than on the United States. Political leadership in these days of in these days of um, of of a, internet, of a huge crisis, 9/11, as, as it, or the, the big depression, or you you can even even the the Americans have faced those. But I think what what those country, what what those lessons told us that this is not uh, this is this is not bipartisan this is this is affecting the whole population and when the nation is being threatened by inside or outside enemies or threats then you have to have leadership that weighs in because people need strength trust and uh, belief and um, whether that is the case in the United States, I will not be able to answer that as a German. I have my opinion, but most of the Americans uh, probably would say, um, and we see this battle uh, every day uh, initially between different states uh, and the, 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 the administration, the federal administration. It's very difficult um, for us to understand these things. I do understand that people feel deprived of, civ of their civil rights. I, I, I totally understand this. People need to work when they're young, when they're healthy. You cannot lock people down. On the other hand, as I said or tried to say in my, um, in my presentation, the virus doesn't respect political barriers or uh, homes or beaches or, 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 uh, uh, or any other um, decision that an individual might take. It just goes. And if you have to pay the price, you have to pay the price. That's what, I, that's what we say here. And I'm sure the United States is the same way. You follow the rulers when you are being threatened. That's true for all the countries. That unfortunately, in some countries, they're misusing that trust. But that's why you have to trust your rulers based on, 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 on the um, expert divide, uh, um, opinions and uh, advisors that are surrounding them. I think it is, it is very natural and very normal um, that people are revolting, that they're going to go out and that they're being upset and that you have unfortunately, very unfortunately, increase of street and domestic violences, you're threatened in businesses. For us as, as Europeans, yeah, as Europeans uh, and as Germans, it's just not, you know, th there's a limit to this. And the limit passes when I see, um, when I see, uh, as an example, um, people with guns getting into the parliament, um, uh, threatening the, the people that try their best to, to get the state and, or keep the state out of trouble. That might be, be the case in Mexico or that might be in, 
in Ecuador, but this is not something for the United States, at least not in my opinion. So I don't want to be too, too, uh, too German. Um, my family lives there. I love America and God bless America for that matter. I hope that the leadership um, at some point will recognize that we have a threat and uh, respond to this threat um, nationally and internationally. An example which we discuss very often here in the, in the face of um, America first, what is happening if we develop a vaccine? Is this a vaccine for Americans or is this a vaccine that is or should be generally available, granted if distribution and, and payment is okay, but it shouldn't be reserved to one country only. But this is something that worries people in Europe. And uh, uh, you might say it stimulates um, research, it stimulates technology, but I think um, it should be we should be in common agreement that if we find something that can fight this terrible virus, um, that this should be an international issue because America will suffer as we do. Thank you, Dr. Grubin. In fact, that's a great note to end on because the future of a vaccine is what we're all looking forward to and to globalize that as soon as possible. I'd like to thank everybody for participating today in the Grand Rounds and Dr. DiMarcheno for inviting this illustrious guest and wish everyone a good day, be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful, Leberhardt. I'll call you. <laughs> yep. <laughs>